grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my brothers, my sisters in Christ. Over 50% of marriages worldwide are arranged marriages. More than half of the people worldwide who said, I do, did so as the result of lengthy negotiation and examination between two families. Now, the practice of arranged marriages seems foreign to us, because it is. It's not mainstream in American culture to have arranged marriages. But in a country where it is mainstream, such as India, India boasts a divorce rate of 1%, whereas in the U.S. it stands at between 40 and 50%. Now you might look at a stat like that, 1% versus 40 to 50, and automatically conclude that maybe arranged marriage, maybe there's something to this whole idea if the divorce rate is so low, But you have to take into account other factors, don't you? Because in a system such as the marriage by arrangement, as opposed to love marriages, they're called, the way that we fall in love and get married like that, the arranged marriage system paves the way for something that is not good, that is more properly termed forced marriages, where one or both parties don't really have a choice in the matter at all, usually the bride. And after she gets married, she if she were to try to get out of the marriage or get try to get out of those negotiations, the consequences can be drastic, even violent. So yeah, she's not getting divorced and adding to that divorce rate at one percent, but it doesn't mean this is a happy scenario at all. If you were to describe your relationship with God in terms of a marriage, what kind of marriage is it? Is it a love marriage like in America where we woo each other, you woo God and then he loves and appreciates you? Is it an arranged marriage? Is it an estranged marriage where you have some connection but not a whole lot? Or does it feel more like a forced marriage where you're kind of here against your will? That's the encouragement in the the book of the prophet Hosea, to look at our relationship with God in terms of a marriage. But the way that this gets communicated, the way that Hosea goes about preaching us into viewing our relationship with God this way, there's a lot of question marks, we might say. Because already at the beginning of Hosea, God comes to Hosea, calls him as a prophet, and he says, Hosea, what I want you to do is one simple thing. I want you to go out and marry a promiscuous woman. Now, a lot of translations translate it that way, promiscuous woman, but that's being perhaps a little bit generous. The woman that Hosea ended up marrying, her name is Gomer, she made money being promiscuous. She was a prostitute. Suffice it to say, Gomer did not save herself for marriage. So even if you come from a background that accepts and and practices arranged marriage, even then, this is kind of a a strange scenario. Now, the Bible tells, tells its story to us in a way that we, as modern American readers, might not always understand, might not always appreciate. The Bible doesn't tell its story like a novel where we see straight into somebody's mind, we get their thoughts, and, and two seconds of action can take chapters upon chapters. What I mean is we would really like to know, wouldn't we, what Gomer thought of this whole situation. But we just don't have it. We don't have what Gomer thought of this arranged marriage. But I think it's reasonable to to think that she was for the idea. If she got married to Hosea, she didn't have to be in the street. She could live in his house. She could survive on his income. She didn't have to be a prostitute anymore. There are a lot of positives to marrying Hosea. And eventually, a couple years later, Gomer bore Hosea three children. So there was something to this relationship. But then somehow, someway, again, we don't have the details here, but somehow Gomer fell away. She ran away. She exited the marriage and Hosea's household. And she fell back 
into familiar ways. She accrued a debt, a pretty hefty debt, 30 shekels of silver. That's just a lot of money. And then all that barley and stuff, that's just a ton of resources. She had this debt that she was never going to be able to pay off, and so she was forced to work it off, likely in the only way she knew how. Gomer became a slave. And one day, it's her turn on the slave auction block. Hosea shows up. What would you do if you were him? This is your wife who abandoned you, who cheated on you, who forsook your marriage vows. And here she is getting her just desserts, isn't she? Who of us would not be tempted to say, good riddance, you got what came to you, you made your bed, now lie in it. Maybe there are a couple people in the world who would find some compassion, who would be able to pony up that price, but then after that would likely say to Gomer, all right, now, now we're done. You're free, but I'm, I want nothing to do with you. There needs to be a boundary here. Who of us would fault Hosea if he just let Gomer have it, let Gomer suffer? Until you realize what the essence, the importance of this marriage was to God's message to his people. From the get-go, God said to Hosea, I want you to marry this woman because your marriage to her is going to be a picture, a metaphor for my relationship with Israel, for my relationship with people. Now, we don't have why Gomer ran away. Maybe she loved Hosea and she just fell into familiar paths. Maybe she hated him. She didn't want to live with this goody two-shoes anymore, so she sprinted out of the house. We don't have her motivations, but we do have Israel's motivations and what they were doing. They had God. They had the ring on their finger connecting them to God. But they enticed, they flirted with, they, they were led astray by all these other practices. We get this weird reference to raisin cakes and it's not like easy, eating raisins is a sin, but these were obviously some form of involvement with pagan idolatrous worship. Part of worshiping Baal or one of these gods was serving up cakes of raisins, and eating it was a part of the worship practice. It's not like raisins are bad, but their spiritual connection to worshiping other gods was bad. How did Israel get this way? How do people get this way? Well, it's not like they just said, we hate God, so we're going to rebel against him. Just like Gomer, very, very un it was unlikely that Gomer said, I hate Hosea, so I'm just going to run out of his house and do my own thing. In fact, who of us sins outright saying it's because we hate God? Like, I'm going to drink too much tonight because I hate God. Or I'm going to criticize my friend behind their back about something that is really none of my business because I hate God. I'm going to harbor hatred in my heart for my fellow man, and I'm going to speak it online because I hate God. Nobody outright says that. So why do we do it? It's because we think it's not that big of a deal. We think as far as our relationship with God, we're okay and so it doesn't matter if I drink too much. It doesn't matter if I lust after somebody. It doesn't matter if I talk bad about someone, criticize them, or harbor hatred in my heart. Because it seems like our default mode is to think of our relationship with God, is to think of God as a rule maker, as if that's all that God is. And that affects the way that we read the Bible, doesn't it? Let's say I want to eat donuts on a Wednesday morning, and God is my rule maker. So I scour the Bible for a passage that says, thou shalt not eat donuts on a Wednesday morning. There's no such passage in the Bible. So yay, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. God is off of my back. Do you hear the emphasis there, though? We're searching the Bible just for permissions or restrictions, and that's how we view our relationship with God. And as long as God doesn't say, thou shalt not, then it must be fine. 
That's how Israel slipped into their spiritual adultery, and the danger is there for us too, brothers and sisters. They went to temple. They brought their sacrifices. They were diligent in their outward worship, but they thought that that meant that they were good to go. So they didn't think it mattered if they had an idol in their house that they prayed to aside from God. They didn't think it mattered if they, if they devoured as many raisin cakes as they wanted to. They didn't think that it mattered because they had given God what he wanted and got him off their back. And isn't that the way we're tempted to think about God? That by being here or by saying his name in conversation, we've done what it takes to get him off our back, so we're free to do whatever we want. But God says, that's not my relationship with you. It's more like a marriage. God is with you all the time. God is everywhere. God wants more than just your outward obedience. He wants your heart, just like your spouse does. What kind of marriage is it if both spouses are just trying to not make each other mad, and that's their entire marriage? Tiptoeing around each other, trying to do what's right, but as soon as either of them is out of the house, they're doing whatever they want all the time. That's not really a marriage, is it? It doesn't work with God either. So there Gomer is on the auction block, and we know what this moment represents. It represents us. Gomer's here with this insurmountable debt that she has accrued on her own, that she will never be able to pay off, just like we are, standing there, encumbered with the debt of our sin, and there's nothing that we can do to pay it off ourselves. So do you want to change your answer to what Hosea should do to Gomer? We, none of us would have faulted Hosea for just letting Gomer have it, but when we realize that's us, What is God going to do with us? I imagine Israel was waiting on pins and needles to find out. And aren't we? The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cake. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way toward you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, they will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. All popular relationship advice would have told God, would have told Hosea to turn tail and run, to leave us standing there. Cut the toxic people out of your life. When someone shows that they're not worthy of your love, then run away from them. Isn't that the relationship advice that you get out there? But what did God do? What did Hosea do? He paid up. He paid the price. And then he welcomed Gomer back into his household, back into his marriage. What did God do with you and me standing there with a debt that we could not pay, the debt of our guilt and sin? He paid up, not with silver or barley, but with the holy, precious blood of his one and only Son, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, on the cross, shed for you to pay the price that you could not pay the debt that your sins accrued, completely forgiven. You know, human beings, we struggle with forgiveness, don't we? It's because we're weak. It's because we don't know everything. We don't know if it's worth trusting people. And it's hard to work through when someone has really hurt you. So what you find you have to do is you have to forgive 
but then you have to forgive again, and then you have to forgive again, because it keeps coming back. I have to think that after this event with Gomer, Hosea was reminded of what she did to him, and he felt sick to his stomach, and he had to forgive her again and again. But you know what? God doesn't have that problem. He doesn't. He is perfectly holy. He is perfectly loving. And so he forgives perfectly. God is not bothered by the remembrance of what you've done to him. God does not kick back up the the memory of the ways you've sinned against him and go, oh yeah, and then need to forgive you all over again. It was one and done. And in a marriage where there has been adultery, tragically, it takes time, it takes years, it takes effort if the two are going to reconcile, doesn't it? It is not easy. It is a long fight to come back after adultery. With God, reconciliation with God took place over a weekend. On Good Friday when Jesus was crucified and then buried, and then Easter Sunday when he rose again, boom, you are reconciled to God. Your reconciliation, though you committed spiritual adultery with God, your reconciliation took place in a second when you were baptized. As soon as that water came over your head in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, boom, reconciled to God. No more problems in your relationship, nothing you had to work through or put effort into. You are back in God's graces. Your reconciliation to God is as easy as receiving Christ's body and blood in the sacrament of communion. Boom! Forgiveness restored in your relationship with God. Your reconciliation to God is held before you on the pages of Scripture. Whenever you confess your sins to God together in worship, boom! You are forgiven. God's reconciliation happened to you. It is done There's no more work you have to do to be loved by God. You are welcomed back into this wonderful relationship with God. Not your rule maker, but the one who loves you more than anyone in the entire universe. He loves you so much that he's even going to help you through those temptations he knows that you face. Hosea knew that Gomer was going to be tempted again to go back into familiar ways. And so he speaks to her that way. God knew that after reconciling his nation Israel to himself, that they would be tempted to go after idols again, because this has been a problem for a while. And so what God was going to do for Israel, as violent and as harsh as it sounds, is he was going to take away those idols. They would not be tempted to think that they were good with God and that he was off their back if they had no temple. So he took away their temple. They would not be tempted to think that God was cool with them having personal idols in their homes if they had no homes. So God took those away. God, as violent and as brutal as it seems, God was removing the chaff. He was burning away the chaff to prevent anything from getting in the way of their relationship with him. Because God loves you with a jealous love, the good kind of jealousy, where God wants you all to himself and he doesn't want to compete with anything else because that's how much he loves you. And so God knows how easy it is for us to go back into thinking that our relationship with him is as if he's just a rule maker and all we have to do is follow the rules. So he reminds us again and again, it's a lot more like a marriage, a good marriage, where both spouses are reminding each other how much they love each other, doing things for each other, they're safe together, they're at peace together. This is your relationship with God. He will not stop giving you reminders of his love for you and how much he cares for you. He will not stop blessing you and guiding you and showing you his love again because he wants you all to himself. 
Notice the order in which these events happen. Hosea puts down the price for Gomer's freedom. He welcomes her into his household, back into his marriage, and then he says, now be faithful. God reconciles you to himself in Christ. You didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. This is an arranged marriage, you could say. He already loves you, already accepts you. And now he says, now be faithful. This is God's way of restoring relationships, which is so different than our way, right? God is not out to get you. He's not playing his cards close to his chest, worried that you're going to hurt him again. No, he accepts you and welcomes you into full, all of his blessings, all of his love. He loves you already. And he says, now, be faithful. Live out your relationship with me. Enjoy your relationship with me. Stick with me. Because only then are you truly blessed. Are you truly safe? And are you truly loved? Amen.